Uh, this morning, it's my great privilege to introduce uh, Dr. Ken Johnson of uh, Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute. Uh, Dr. Johnson and his team have been engaged in some really exciting research pertaining to sensors over the past many years. They, have, they are uh, focused on the development of chemical sensors that can be deployed in large-scale wireless sensor networks and the application of these tools to the studies of chemical cycling throughout the ocean. So they are developing uh, sensors for seawater nutrients, pH, and uh, field portable analytical systems for trace elements such as iron, cobalt, manganese, and zinc. And these sensors have already been integrated into commercially available platforms that you can go out and purchase. And um, uh, they are already deployed in sensor networks uh, for uh, coastal ocean and uh, remote region monitoring, uh, you know, in the open ocean. Uh, and they are, you know, they are already reporting back to the internet in real time. Uh, they have really done a lot of pioneering studies, um, including uh, the first open ocean iron fertilization experiments. Uh, he has uh, published well over a hundred uh, papers in uh, scientific journals and he is an elected fellow of the American Geophysical Union. So, thank you, Dr. Johnson. Okay, well, thank you very much for the opportunity to come and speak to you today, uh, organizer Geogesh in particular. Um, you have to excuse me, I'm starting to get a cold, so I have to have my tea to make it through. So um, I want to, before I get started, acknowledge the, uh, uh, the institutions that have enabled the work that I've done, the David and Lucille Packard Foundation, the National Science Foundation, the National Ocean Partnership Program, um, have all funded the work that I'm going to talk to you about today. Um, as I've talked to people at this meeting, uh, uh, People aren't really aware uh, of, of my institution. So I actually thought I'd start and, and uh, just give you a couple slides on Mabari, the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute. Um, Mabari uh, that was founded by David Packard, uh, the late David Packard, uh, founder of Hewlett Packard. Um, our mission is the development of better instrument systems and methods for scientific research in the deep ocean. Uh, there are about 200 people at Mabari that uh, do everything from research, engineering, uh, run ships, uh, and uh, we have a strong outreach education uh, program as well. Uh, operate on about a $33 million a year budget from the uh, David and Lucille Packard Foundation, which enables the, uh, the work that we do. It's, it's interesting that um, I live in sort of a parallel universe to what you do. Um, uh, only in the ocean, and, and even, in fact, in oceanography in general. So it's very interesting to come to this meeting because there, there are so many things we do in parallel, but we don't talk to each other very much. So I really enjoy the opportunity to come and share with you what we're doing, and have, I've learned a, a tremendous amount um, uh, by listening to the talks today. But even just at my own institution, there are programs going um, the, uh, uh, to do things like uh, real-time qPCR sandwich hybridization bioassays on an oceanographic mooring so that you can um, have probes for certain harmful algal species such as pseudonychia. It's sort of a, a, a gene chip, a sort of a macro scale version of a gene chip, but if pseudonychia is present in the, in the water, um, uh, the uh, the probes for the for that the, uh, algal species light up pseudonychia causes paralytic shellfish poisoning. Lots of interest in that. Uh, or you can have uh, probes uh, for Alexandrium, which causes amnesic shellfish poisoning. They joke, you know, if you've eaten the shellfish and you wake up and you can't move, it's pseudonychia there. And if you wake up and can't remember what you had for dinner, it was Alexandrium. Um, but uh, this, uh, these instruments run, uh, not work I do, but colleagues at Mabari, they actually do the whole assay. You can put it on a mooring in the coastal ocean. It, it uh, you know, does the work, phones home, and you can tell if, uh, if specific species of, uh, of um, phytoplankton are present. Uh, colleagues working in C2 laser Raman spectroscopy to look at gas hydrate uh, chemistry in the ocean. Uh, colleagues doing NMR, uh, 
on the bottom of the ocean, in this case, NMR at four kilometers depth, systems being prepared, and colleagues working on carbon dioxide sensors. I'll talk a lot about CO2 today, but other colleagues at Mabari are very active in developing CO2 sensors. So a very parallel kind of work in terms of chemical sensors, lots of acoustical sensor work as well. And I'm not going to talk about any of this. I'm going to talk about developing very simple chemical sensors. So the gist of the talk, why develop a global ocean chemical and biological sensor array? So a bit of oceanography 101, why we want to do this. Examples of the sensors we've developed mostly, I'll focus on ones developed in my laboratory. And I'll say a few words of encouragement about the sensors that are needed and developments in other labs as well. So BioArgo, really what the goal is to observe the metabolism of the ocean, its spatial and temporal variability in the processes that control it. This is an example plot of oxygen depth from the surface to 300 meters and time running from the year 2002 up until 2012. So there's about 10 years of data there. This is done with oxygen sensors on a platform I'll describe to you called a profiling float. But what is the metabolism of the ocean? Well, really it's recognizing the basic processes like photosynthesis. So those red dots of oxygen build up over there are the reflection each year of the annual cycle of photosynthesis, which is written down here in the bottom of the plot. Simple chemistry, CO2 and water and light makes some organic molecule plus O2. And we have this annual cycle. You see, when you look at the plot, you see interannual variability in oxygen. You see temporal variability in the production of oxygen. That's one of the things we'd like to understand. We'd like to look at this from the other side, from carbon. We'll talk a bit about carbon as well. And we'd like to understand the processes that drive actual this variability, which relates back to physics, ocean physics, and so on. So, you know, BioArgo, I'll talk a bit about what Argo is as well here. And BioArgo would be the biological, biogeochemical end of it. But really what I want to observe is the variability in oxygen, carbon, and nitrogen cycling in the entire ocean. And I'll make the argument you can't do this with ships, which is historically how oceanography has done it. We need robotic platforms with chemical sensors that are going to allow us to do this. So why do we want to do, why do we want to study ocean metabolism? Well, it's the, the oceans are undergoing some phenomenal changes. 70% of the world's surface, this is an issue of science from a few years ago, but the changing oceans, the Arctic ice is going away, the oceans are warming, they're getting more acidic, oxygen is going away in many regions of the ocean. All of these things have, have the potential to have profound impacts on, on ocean biology, on the ocean metabolism. And no one really is looking at, at what's really happening in the open ocean. So we need a system. A couple of examples. Carbon dioxide increasing in the atmosphere. So we have here in this plot, so this is time from 1990 to 2012. Basically the black line up here is carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, measurements at the model, the classical healing curve of increasing CO2 in the atmosphere due to burning fossil fuels. Of course, carbon dioxide is a gas and it equilibrates in the surface ocean. And the blue line is the surface ocean concentration of carbon dioxide going up right in parallel with the atmosphere. A lot more interannual signal due to production and respiration in the water, but going right along. In the lower panel, of course, CO2 is, when it dissolves in water, forms carbonic acid. And you can actually measure now the pH of the ocean starting to decrease. In this plot, pH has gone down from 8.12 to about 8.06. These are measurements near Hawaii. Rather small changes. And one would go, gosh, why do we really care about this sort of 0.04, 0.05 pH change in the ocean? 
The answer is that the ocean is, is really delicately balanced with respect to the solubility of calcium carbonate. And there are whole classes of organisms that, that, that essentially live by precipitating a calcium carbonate shell. Many of them cannot precipitate calcium carbonate when the ocean becomes undersaturated with the mineral calcite or the minerals aragonite. Um, and uh, that basically starts to happen, this undersaturation um, starts to happen at around when the atmosphere reaches 450 parts per million of atmospheric CO2. Um, the, the lower paper, uh, extensive dissolution of live pteropods in the southern ocean. Basically, you can go to the southern ocean and find regions that are actually right on the edge now becoming um, undersaturated. Pteropods are one of these the little marine snail. Um, makes a shell of calcium carbonate and they're starting to dissolve. They cannot, you know, um, maintain their, their, um, their uh, uh, shells against a, uh, in a solution that's corrosive. And we kind of go, why do we care about pteropods? Well, um, how many people like salmon? You know, so a lot of people like salmon. So in the North Pacific, pteropods form 80% of the, of the food for salmon when they're in the open, open ocean. Um, Region. So, you know, the, the pteropods, which is sort of a fraction, small fraction of the ecosystem, but if they go away, that ripples back into, um, into uh, other uh, branches of the food chain. And so 450, that's when the Southern Ocean becomes undersaturated. Um, so, uh, southern Ocean goes first because it's coldest, and the way the thermodynamics work, um, the, the, the colder the water is, the sooner the carbonate, the calcium carbonate becomes undersaturated. Um, if you look at this plot uh, in the upper panel, CO2 has gone in the atmosphere, gone for, in about 20 years, have gone from 350 to 400. In about 20 more years, the Southern Ocean is going to reach that tipping point of 400 ppm, uh, 450 ppm CO2, become undersaturated, and um, potentially serious impacts. Uh, we would like to understand what ultimately happens to the metabolism of the ocean when these things uh, happen. And of course, you'd like to have a baseline before you get there. So um, these are the kinds, one of the, one of the kinds of things we're uh, interested in studying. Uh, another example, uh, new, numerous studies point to climate and decreasing ocean phytoplankton productivity links. So phytoplankton, the, the uh, microscopic organisms that, uh, uh, conduct photosynthesis in the ocean. I've just uh, clipped out three of many papers um, that basically argue that um, based on satellite records of, of ocean color, that the productivity of the ocean is declining in time. So uh, ocean primary production and climate, global decadal changes. If you can read the abstract, it says that uh, uh, global primary production has declined more than 6% since the early 1980s. Uh, another paper, two papers uh, on the bottom and from Nature, Climate Driven Trends in Contemporary Ocean Productivity, um, uh, which really relates to El Nino, La Nina cycle driven changes. But again, the ocean, uh, these, these cycles, very, very responsive to climate. And the, the bottom paper, which combines the, both satellites and shipboard records uh, for the last 100 years, uh, argues that, that the phytoplankton in the ocean have been, de been declining for the last century. Um, all of these are really based on, on indirect measurements, uh, either satellites looking at the color of the color of light leaving the ocean, more plants, less, uh, you know, uh, more green, green, less, uh, 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 you know, a significant shift in the light leaving the water. You'd really like to have records in the water. The satellites only see the, you know, the upper few tens of meters of the ocean don't see very far down in. So uh, lots of evidence that the ocean metabolism might be changing, which if you're trying to manage, say, fisheries, right? If fisheries are, are going down, is that because um, ocean productivity is generally declining, or is that because we're overfishing the ocean? We don't really, you know, if you're frank, don't know the answer to those questions. You would like to have a system that really measured the metabolism of the ocean. Um, Lots of reasons why the productivity of the ocean might be going down. So here, um, a, a, a little bit more of Oceanography 101 for you. This is a vertical profile of the concentration of nitrate um, in seawater. So the left, uh, the vertical axis is depth uh, down to a thousand from the surface down to a thousand meters. Nitrate concentration from zero to 44 micromolar. This is data from one of our robotics platforms. Um, 
profiles up and down every five days, telemeters the data back to shore. And the uh, point, let's look a little bit at the surface. So um, again, sensor data. And what you see, let's see, where'd my mouse go? So um, the profile here every five days reported back, back to shore. And about once a month, if you, you look at this data, you see events like this. Um, which are basically raising what we would call the nitrocline, the nitrate gradient up close to the surface. In most of the ocean where there's sunlight, there's essentially zero nitrate. The plants are, are, are limited by a lack of fertilizer. That's why the ocean, say, near Hawaii is not green water like you'd see here in Chesapeake Bay. It's clear blue. There are no plants, and there are no plants because there's no fertilizer. But about once a month, you see the physics, so you get these nonlinear uh, interactions of physics that will lift the nitrocline up, and that's really what feeds the ecosystem. Um, physical interactions, if the ocean is warming, you might expect physics to change. And in particular, if the surface ocean is getting warmer and less dense, it takes more energy to lift um, colder, denser water up to the surface. And uh, you might expect that these kind of processes are becoming in a warmer climate becoming rarer and rarer. Harder, it's harder and harder for the wind, for ocean physics to lift nutrients up into the uh, sunlit region of the ocean. So there are a lot of reasons why productivity in the ocean might be going down, but the fact is, um, I'll, I'll make the point, you can't study this from a ship. It's just too expensive. There aren't enough ships. You need a robotic sensor system. And in fact, um, this is a plot uh, of uh, the data in the U.S. National Oceanographic Data Center's archives. So the NODC essentially archives all of the measurements that the, both the U.S. Uh, oceanographic community and the, in the, essentially the global oceanographic community make. Um, and this is a plot not of nitrate concentration, but of the number of nitrate measurements. Uh, that are in the database. And this database goes back to 1900, okay? So it's over 100 years long. What you see, um, color scale down here, if it's red, we have more than 20 measurements per one degree square in the database. And if it's blue, there's one. And if it's white, there are zero measurements in the database, right? And most of the ocean is blue. There's one measurement of nitrate, you know, has been made in 100 years. It's kind of hard to measure change. Um, if you have, you know, an N of 1, uh, or maybe it's easy to measure change if you have an N of 1. I don't know if you're horribly undersampled. Um, you know, near, near the coasts of, of, uh, uh, of the continents, along the U.S. West Coast, uh, Asia, East Coast, uh, North Sea, so on, there are a lot of measurements. But most of the ocean, I mean, there are places where there just haven't been nitrate measurements made at all, and, and most of the places, you know, it's like 1. Um, this has all been done by ships. I guess, the, and the point here simply is that, you know, we've had a hundred years of oceanography with ships. We haven't been able to answer the questions we need to, to answer. Um, we need another, uh, another, um, approach. And so what, what, uh, how are we doing this? We need, uh, in, we need to instrument the world ocean with chemical and biological sensors. Now, this is going to sound impossible, but I need sensors that are stable for years. They're low power. They're disposable. Um, they operate through large pressure and temperature uh, ranges. They're really sensitive down to the part per billion level. They're accurate, they're precise. If I want to measure change, I can't have drifty sensors. Um, they have to be able to deliver their data in real time, and you really the production has to be scalable, uh, you know, to units of uh, to thousands of units. It can't be that some, you know, super technician is the only person that can build these sensors one at a time, right? Um, so, can we do this? And, and basically, um, the rest of the talk, I'm going to argue this, in fact, is happening. Um, so, just to keep myself going here, I have to, um, I'm not making a phone call, I'm trying to keep my, uh, keep my clock going. Okay. So, I don't run out of time. So, First thing you need is a, is a, a, a platform to deploy your sensors on. Uh, I'm going to talk almost exclusively about profiling floats. These are devices about the size of a gas cylinder. They have what's called a buoyancy engine in them. And basically, there is a, in the case of the ones we use, there's a, a large piston here. It's, the piston is filled with oil. They can push the oil out into a bladder, expand the bladder, which essentially changes the volume of the float. 
And uh, if you change the volume, you don't change the mass, you change the density of the float, rather like a, a helium balloon. If I can let the helium into the bag and the balloon, it'll go up, and if I suck the helium out of the bag, the balloon will go down. A profiling float um, basically operates in that same mode in the ocean, fill them full of batteries, they have a five-year lifetime, they basically, um, uh, a cycle that the floats will go through, they'll spend 20 minutes on the surface uh, transmitting data to low Earth orbit satellite uh, communication networks, they'll descend to a thousand meters, park at a thousand meters for one to ten days, we, we run ours on a five-day cycle, after five days the float will descend to two thousand meters and then make measurements coming to the surface of chemistry, reach the surface and, and then spend that 20 minutes at the surface telemeter its data, repeat the cycle. Um, if you do that at about five days, the floats have a lifetime of about five years. So my sensors really need to run about five years. Um, the good news is that you can do this whole cycle with a volume change uh, of oil of about 250 milliliters if you get the uh, float balance just right. So um, uh, uh, 250 milliliter volume change of the float, and it'll go down to 2,000 meters or back up. Um, so that's what a float looks like. Uh, the sensors are all right here. Uh, there's the buoyancy, there's electronics up here, a buoyancy engine here, and the rest of it's filled full of lithium batteries. Um, one person could pick the float up. Uh, you've got a, a piece of line to lower it over the edge of the ship, and you drive away, and no one is going to get that back. It's going to run for five years, never to be touched by a human again. Okay, so, uh, my sensor network has to, has to run for five years. My sensors have to be stable for five years. They have to operate down to 2,000 meters. Temperature at 2,000 meters will be about 2 degrees C. It could be 30 at the surface. So I have to have calibrated data through pressure, temperature, salinity, gradients, and so on. Um, but the platform exists. So the Argo, we're BioArgo. The Argo array. Um, is a consortium of 30 countries that are deploying these floats to measure the temperature, the heat budget of the ocean. So there are 3,500 of these in the ocean. The colored dots are just which countries they're deploying. And there's a list down there. It goes from Australia up to the United Kingdom and everybody in between from Bulgaria to New Zealand to um, so on. Um, BioArgo is now spinning up, and there are now 11 countries deploying floats with chemical and biological sensors. This is a, a, a plot of the current status. There are 200 profiling floats with dissolved oxygen, uh, over 40 with nitrate that was starting to deploy floats with uh, pH and floats with bio-optics uh, in, in the world ocean. Uh, as I say, 11 countries. This uh, is the, uh, the network that my laboratory is sustaining down here, 46 of those, uh, about 300 floats. So uh, sensors, how do we do this? Optical, so nitrate, one of the key things, it's the, it's the nutrient that controls productivity of the ocean. So uh, this is one of the sensors that has been developed in our laboratory. Um, turns out nitrate has a moderate UV absorption band down around 220 nanometers deep in the UV. It's a pi to pi star transition. Molar absorptivity is about 4,000, which is, you know, it's not huge, but it's not, you know, negligible. Um, uh, the, one of the complications is that this uh, would be the absorption spectrum due to nitri 30 micromolar nitrate, sort of a typical value. Bromide present in seawater at about 840 micromolar uh, has, a, has a somewhat stronger uh, absorption spectrum. So I'm looking at, at a shoulder nitrate on a, on a bromide uh, signal. We'll talk a bit about that. But, but otherwise, basically, you can just build a UV spectrophotometer. Um, and so we've written about this uh, MC2 ultraviolet spectrophotometry for high-resolution long-term monitoring of nitrate bromide bisulfide. Turns out hydrogen sulfide also absorbs strongly in UV. Fortunately, most of the ocean is not uh, full of sulfide. Um, basic instrument, you have a, uh, 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 it's all commercially available components, a Horaeus fiber uh, UV light source, uh, fiber optically coupled, a reflection probe, whoops, that sticks in the water. Um, this is the, the uh, 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 rectangles are a pressure housing and um, uh, light goes up into the water. Uh, we have to have an, a, an open uh, sensor. Uh, so yesterday we heard about closed sensors. Ours have to be open, and the light is reflected back to a 256 element photodiode array, uh, a Zeiss uh, spectrometer. It has some electronics. Um, 
these are uh, commercially available now from a company called Satlantic, um, uh, uh, being used in everywhere from agricultural runoff to monitoring the open ocean. Um, so in the case that we're talking about here, so the Mabari ISIS, ISIS in situ ultraviolet spectrophotometer, this is what you get when you integrate it into a profiling float. So I make 60 nitrate measurements on a profile from 1,000 meters to the surface. The instrument has a precision of about 0.2 micromoles per liter. Um, the float endurance is the 320 profiles. There's enough battery power in the float to make 320 profiles from 1,000 meters to the surface, which equates to a four and a half year lifetime um, if I cycle every five days. If I want to go five years, I can cycle every six days. It's sort of, you have to make a decision how you spend your electrons. You start to get into this work, you have to think very seriously about power. So um, to make one nitrate measurement, 44 joules. Okay, so how many how many joules per measurement? Um, the people you know that run these large scale networks would like you to only make use sort of like one. Um, 44 takes 20 percent of the battery, so it's essentially one year off the lifetime of the float to, to make nitrate measurements. Um, that's the most power hungry sensor on the float. Uh, mass is a big problem. Uh, when we integrated it, the designers basically told us we had a kilogram to play around with. Uh, we uh, built the instrument that weighs 800 grams, okay, but the floats don't have infinite lift capacity. And if you want to read about this, a uh, uh, um, paper in the, uh, probably very, a journal unfamiliar to you, but the Journal of Atmospheric and Oceanic Technology, um, our version of uh, IEEE sensors, um, but uh, uh, published this year describing the integration uh, of the sensor. And so uh, these are out in the ocean, they're running, this is, um, uh, what a UV spectrum might look like. Um, so the black line here is the actual raw UV spectrum. There's a component due to bromide and there's a component down here. That's the nitrate absorption spectrum. You have to deconvolve this black line into a baseline um, and into the various components. It's interesting that the sensor is sort of um, self-correcting for drift. So for example, if the baseline is over time, the lamp changes, uh, organics accumulate on the optic, it would um, drift up to there. You'd still get the same nitrate concentration. So here's 1.8 and here's a spectrum 1.3. But uh, it, if you measure a whole spectrum, not just one wavelength, you can you can correct for a drift of the instrument. Um, and this is what you get. So here's a five year long record of nitrate in the in the North Pacific. Um, reference to a paper we published in Nature a, a, a year or so ago, nitrate supply from deep to near surface waters. And as I mentioned, you know, there's sort of these events that happen about once a month. This kind of resolution has never been seen. You can't afford to go out on a ship and just sit there for five years and sample. Um, so these, the little uh, vertical spikes in uh, nitrate are these nonlinear interactions of wind and currents and so on that are transporting nitrate up into the euphotic zone um, uh, uh, and, uh, you know, possibly could change in a, in a changing climate since wind, you know, will change as, as it warms. Another example from the North Pacific, the Gulf of Alaska. So near Hawaii, this is near Hawaii, there's essentially never any nitrate in the surface. This would all be below our detection limit, but essentially zero up here. You go into the North Pacific, there's um, uh, a, a lot of nitrate, the winter storms mix nitrate into the surface, so that's winter, and then the plants grow, consume nitrate in the summer, winter mixing, uh, uh, put nitrate back, plants grow. You see, again, interannual variability in nitrate. Uh, you'd like to know if that is real, and so here's a comparison. There's uh, this particular place, a ship goes out three times a year. The nitrate uh, concentration here for three years, and this is what the ship measures, and this is what the little black dots are with the profiling float measures um, over three years. Data looks very good. Uh, you look at a thousand meters, um, much less variability, so the float um, data is right here. There's a mismatch uh, with the measurements that are uh, made on board ship after going back and forth. Um, the uh, uh, ship operators now understand the problem is at their end, and the sensor, if you, I mean, the basic, the beauty of the sensor, if you understand the metrology of the sensor, I mean, it's not a whole lot that can go wrong, and, um, and on the other hand, in the laboratory measurements, there, there's a lot that can go wrong. 
And uh, this mismatch is, is a problem in the laboratory uh, calibrations, not in the sensor data in the ocean. Um, uh, so I talked a bit about acidification. So that's nitrate, P uh, pH. Um, whoops, a daisy. Excuse myself, I, uh, I forgot my watch when I came. So we got a few more minutes. Okay, so uh, the ocean acidification. Um, so we showed this before, pH is going down in the surface ocean. We would like to have a good uh, pH sensor. The signals are small. So the acidification signal is order of 2 milli pH per year. Okay. Um, there's also a production respiration signal, which is uh, in, the, in here, there's an annual cycle of, of pH uh, due to plants growing in the summer and then um, uh, uh, less growth in the winter. You'd like to be able to resolve both of these. Um, but so here's the challenge, two milli pH per year uh, you'd like to be able to resolve. So um, the nitrate sensor was an example where we basically invented the sensor in our lab. pH is a, 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 an example, fairly practical. I decided that um, there are so many people working on pH, probably somebody has solved the problem and I don't need to reinvent the wheel. I just So we just started buying or copying whatever uh, uh, other approaches to pH measurement than the common glass electrode approach. And the winner of our own internal competition was a device made by Honeywell, the Honeywell DuraFet. Um, it's an ion sensitive field effect transistor. We published a paper uh, describing uh, our work with it back in 2010, Limnology and Oceanography Methods, another uh, sensor journal for oceanography. Uh, since uh, this was 2010, since then it's been used in a, a number of studies. Um, uh, uh, the bottom line is you cannot measure drift in this sensor. Uh, I cannot, as good as I can measure pH, the sensor is better than I can measure um, pH. And there are a couple of reasons for that. Um, one is that Honeywell uh, took quite a bit different approach to packaging of the sensor rather than, so there's a very nice article in, in Sensors and Actuators on Encapsulation of ISBET Sensor Chips um, back in 2005. Uh, this author um, over here, Jim Connery, is the Honeywell engineer that was responsible for development of the DuraFet. But basically, Honeywell, rather than encapsulating uh, the chip in epoxy, is sort of the normal um, problem. And then if we had the problem we heard about yesterday. You have to have an open sensor, right? You have to have some part of that open to the open to the water. Water always penetrates down the chip epoxy, the silicon epoxy seal. Eventually, you know. So I want this to be stable for five years, and there is no epoxy bond that really survives in the deep ocean for that kind of time period. So Honeywell's invention was which they patented is this idea of a media seal, which is basically an O-ring. O-ring seal the uh, 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 sensor and they're stable forever. Um, the one thing that we, a couple of things we contributed to it, um, you have to have a reference electrode, right? And so seawater has a very well-defined amount of chloride in it. So we use as, a, as our reference, it's a chloride ion sensitive uh, uh, electrode uh, immersed directly in seawater, right? There's no liquid junction or anything. Um, Here's an ISFET now packaged for high pressure. The problem with the DuraFET is that it's only, um, standard DuraFET's only pressure rated to about 70 meters depth, 100 PSI. Um, I want to go to, um, you know, thousands of meters of depth. And so we've repackaged them. We run our own reference electrodes. Um, and uh, you end up with a, an instrument that basically responds to the activity of hydrochloric acid. Um, key in doing all this is, as I alluded to earlier is understanding the metrology of the sensor and so you can write down a very explicit equation um, basically a perfect Nernstian device as far as we can tell follows the Nernst equation these red terms you can measure in the lab to calibrate it uh, a temperature coefficient pressure coefficients the yellow terms are uh, this is the activity coefficient of hydrochloric acid in seawater that's been published by the late Roger Bates uh, um, if you're in the pH, you'll know uh, Bates' name. Uh, I can tell you what the chloride concentration of the ocean is everywhere. And if I plug all that into the equation and I measure VRS to run the device as a constant uh, source to drain current, measure the voltage from the reference to the source, um, uh, follows this equation. And I can measure the concentration of protons um, phenomenally. And so one of the, one of the, 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 the points I, it always astounds me, so we're down measuring one milli pH, that's equivalent to a 0.2% error 
in the proton concentration. I've got to have a sensor that's stable for chemistry to 0.2 percent for five years. Okay, um, and basically the device does that. Um, so here are a bunch of profiles of pH uh, surface down to 1800 meters. Um, Two profiling floats, both deployed at Hawaii uh, different times, and then measurements made by the, the Hawaii sends the ship, the University of Hawaii sends the ship out every month, and in green are the uh, Hawaii measurements. And at depth, they agree quite nicely. At the surface, there's a little mismatch. That's the annual cycle of production and respiration um, uh, difference. So like our floats were deployed at different times in the year. But excellent agreement basically throughout the water column. and. Um, you end up with a record, this little animation on the left hand panel is pH, the right hand panel is oxygen, the date is running on the top, and these floats will just run and measure pH at depth where ox or pH and oxygen should be quite stable. Um, you see essentially no variability in the sensor uh, uh, results. This is a six month long record. Um, it will run over and over again here in a minute, but what's interesting, uh, you look up here, you, you will see variability in both oxygen and pH in this region, which they really hadn't sampled before at Hawaii. That's due, an, due to an eddy coming by, and um, an eddy coming by at Christmas when no one is sampling. Okay, so the floats out there, uh, see it in January. So, um, you know, we have a system now that measures pH. Uh, we're about to go, uh, so why, why don't we use CHIP? We're about to deploy 18 floats on a cruise that goes from Tasmania up to uh, Tahiti next March. 50 days of sea time to do this, this transit. Okay, ships are, they go like 10 miles an hour, right? I mean, think about that. I mean, if you drive to work, you know, across the U.S. at 10 miles an hour, um, kind of, kind of slow. Um, I just want to make a point that uh, that uh, the XPRIZE people have actually now announced a $2 million competition for a better pH pro a better pH sensor uh, in the ocean. I think we've set the bar kind of high, but but there's lots of there's room to improve. Um, so if you go to the XPRIZE uh, uh, website, there there is a, there is a $2 million prize now being offered for a a, uh, a super pH sensor um, in the ocean. Um, and I'll just close with a few other examples of other sensors, an almost ideal example for oxygen, I didn't say anything about it, but the Andera oxygen optode, it's a little too slow, but otherwise almost perfect, so 30 to 40 second response rate. Uh, it's a, uh, a, a fluorescence lifetime uh, sensor uh, using platinum porphyrin. Uh, they're stable. Uh, this is a rec two years of oxygen data in the North Atlantic. Uh, Oxygen two, over two years, 200 at 1,800 meters, 295 plus and minus 0 0.7. Okay, uh, over you know that's pretty darn stable. And the authors of the paper, this is not our work. This is uh, Andrews Kengberg at all. They would actually argue argue that P, uh, the oxygen values of the circles that dip at the right is actually real. Okay, and so the sensor was actually better than plus minus 0.7. Um, uh, phenomenal. Uh, so this is really work that's come basically from your community, Otto Wolf by Singo Clemont, um, uh, and ultimately became a commercial product. Uh, Bio-optics, that's sort of standard. We can measure chlorophyll. Um, there are a group of other people working on other chemicals that we would love to be able to measure on close. We'd love to be able to measure dissolved orthosilicic acid. Um, uh, one of the major groups in, of, of Critters in the ocean diatoms make silicic shells, and that re the diatoms are sort of the control the cycling of many other things. We'd love to be able to measure silica. We'd love to be able to measure phosphate. And Veronique Garçon uh, at uh, the Legos Lab in Toulouse, France, is working on this. They're building. It's basically a solid molybdate electrode, which they can electrochemically generate molybdate ion, which then reacts. Uh, uh, with phosphate or with silica if you tune it to make a, a, a either a silico molybdate or a phospho molybdate compound which they analyze electrochemically. Um, this is all published now. They're working to incorporate that on the profiling floats. But dissolved silica, dissolved phosphate, uh, tremendous interest. Um, direct measurements of carbon dioxide. Arnie Kortzinger's group um, have been putting CO2 sensors, P partial pressure of CO2 sensors on profiling floats, another journal of atmospheric and oceanic technology paper. These sensors are too slow. 
I think, to be directly useful. You need, so they have sort of a response time of several minutes, and the floats come up um, faster than that, and, um, and the signal gets smeared out. So to make a good CO2 measurement, they have to invert, re, it, it, take the slow sensor signal and try and figure out what the real CO2 concentration was. A fast CO2 sensor, sort of plus and minus a couple of ppm stability would be great. Jim Bishop at UC Berkeley. So um, as the ocean gets more acidic, we're going to have fewer and fewer organisms that make calcium carbonate shells. He's building a particulate inorganic carbon sensor. Calcite is birefringent, rotates polarized light. Um, so uh, he's got a laser. He has two cross polarizers. Um, if there's calcite between the cross in the water between the cross polarizers, um, the no if there's no calcite, no light gets through. Uh, the the light's been uh, been polarized. The other the cross polarizer doesn't let anything through. If there is calcite, it'll rotate the light, and there, a signal will appear uh, at the other end. Uh, so um, this is this is working and and deployed on uh, profiling floats now. But uh, tremendous interest in measuring, you know, essentially the ecosystem impact of the acidification. Um, Todd Marks at Scripps is building on-chip titrators, uh, inset-based alkalinity titration. Um, uh, 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 Bergveld uh, published this back in 95. There have been commercial products that have come and gone, uh, being resurrected for oceanography. Basically, you lay, they take that, the, the inset chip, the pH sensor, lay a gold an anode down on it, electrochemically generate protons, and then watch the protons diffuse across the gate of the, of the pH sensor. And you basically uh, get a titration curve where uh, time is volume, the way I guess I think of it. Um, and you can determine the alkalinity, the amount of, of alkaline ions, which is a, a major thing that we'd like to understand in oceanography. Um, I don't have a, a, a slide here for iron, but if somebody has a great idea to do iron at sort of part per trillion levels, um, you know, there'd be a market. And um, with that, I will just say uh, ocean chemistry is changing from a shipboard science to an autonomous sensor-based science. It has to, to address uh, the global change. We can't do it from ships. We need robots and we need sensors. Thank you.